Um, yeah, it's crazy. So, so one of one of my little light bulbs in this Ukraine situation is that it appears that Putin and Sirkin and company are masters of nonlinear warfare. They're extremely, extremely sophisticated and good yeah, at totally. it. Yeah. And they are shit at actual warfare. Like, like, wow, like the, the Russian army has been a complete disappointment, a, a shocking disappointment. Yeah. Um, and and it's just kind of crazy. But but and then they're losing they're losing. I just I just get the feeling I get the feeling that a lot of that is actually the, the Russian troops themselves. Uh -huh. who, who are actually just who are actually just looking at it and saying, uh, "Hang on a minute, these are our people. What what we are actually shelling our own our own friends, pretty right. much." Right. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, anyone feel strongly about it or want to jump in on what's been happening a bit? And and Susan, I watched the video. I loved it. We'll get uh, we'll we'll come back to it. We can come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to spend a little bit of time decompressing on on uh, Ukraine. Is there oh. such a thing? Can we de uh, decompress on that? <laughs> um, we might have to periodically. Is the thing is uh, you know a couple pieces I've seen and re and read were like, hey, this is really just the beginning of a protracted, messy thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and and it could cascade outward across Europe, and it, you know it's going to have economic repercussions, and and and. Yeah. And the and the avenues for Putin to suddenly decide to back off or to, to suddenly be pushed aside are slim. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's not there's really not a lot of um, unless something dramatic happens and unexpected happens, this thing slogs for a while. Yeah. And and it's a slog that Putin kind of brought on himself. Well, Although there's lots of interesting things about NATO and him, you know, uh, making Ukraine part of NATO being the, la the, the last straw and all that kind of thing. Mr. Cassio, good to see you. Very good morning. Hi. Very good morning. We're, we're just sort of slowly um, marinating into Ukraine for a moment um, as possibly the start of a longish thing. Um, I, remember, I remember attending an event that Chris Meyer ran at the CBI in Boston just before the Bush v. Gore election. And we were meeting, we had an event during the day and then we were gonna watch the election together. And we all made bets right. about when we thought that the election would be decided. And nobody had a time for final verdict longer than a week away. No, nobody, nobody picked any time more than a week away. And it was what, 54 days or how long, how long did that drag out? Yeah. Some, long, some long time. And so, and so sometimes really weird things happen, right? And uh, this feels like one of them. Because, yeah. cause, cause, you know, Putin presses the button and, and launches troops in. And as far as I'm concerned, I've been well marketed to where I think that, you know, Russian troops are the people you need to be really afraid of. And they're, they're lethal and they know they, they have a martial art called Sambo and they have the best weapons and they have like, these Spetsnaz who can do anything, right? And it turns out they can apparently do almost nothing. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. And, and part of it is, seems to be congenital, part of it seems to be corruption. Part of it I'm thinking, I'm suspecting might actually be a brownout by the smarter next tier of troops. Because they've seen Afghanistan, Afghanistan like, and by the way, from what I can tell, Afghanistan cost Russia only 15,000 soldiers. I thought it was much more. Hmm. 15,000 15, soldiers oh. died in Afghanistan. Uh, Grozny, Chechnya was apparently somewhere between five and 20. They don't have good numbers. But Ukraine claims to have already killed 12,000 Russians. Russia will admit to 500. So the number's somewhere in between. Um, right. Well, the bodies but, have to go home, don't they? But that's well, not really. Um, one of the articles I read was that the Russians are leaving the bodies on the field so they don't have to have draped coffins come home. And so they'll be buried in Ukraine as Ukrainian casualties. They'll get unmarked graves or whatever. Who knows, right? But the, but but that's a possibility because just like Trump didn't want to do testing because when you test, that's when you get statistics on COVID. Like <laughs> Putin don't. may be doing everything. Yeah, Putin may be doing everything he can. And he also gave a speech where he said conscripts will not be sent into battle. Only professional troops will be sent into battle. And it's like. Actually, that is such a bald-faced lie among many other lies. But the conscripts are the ones who are being captured and killed. Like, mm -hmm. you know, 
And, and, and it's like we're hearing stories of people calling their moms. The smartest thing the Ukrainians are doing, among others, is like getting soldiers to call their moms and then filming them crying into the phone saying, mom, I was teaching two weeks ago, then I got my call in and, and I was told it was a training exercise and here I am captured by Ukrainians. Uh, it's like crazy. Unfortunately, that's a violation of the Geneva Convention. There's only a few violations going on, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, as as uh, the various violations of the Geneva Convention going on in Ukraine, that's kind of on the minor side. But it is you know, illegal for them to be um, put, basically putting captured soldiers or cap captured units up uh, for public view. Oh, so you're, you're saying the Ukrainians are violating the, the Geneva Convention because that is shaming captured soldiers. Yeah. Uh, they're just helping them call their moms. Um, and then see, they're, but they're saying. video recording that and putting that up on as, YouTube as or whatever. propaganda back. So I'm, uh, and I was mis misguidedly going to a thought that I put in my brain, evidence that Putin is committing war crimes or crimes against humanity, oh, which... of which there is plenty. Um, right. but, but you're right. You're, you're supposed to treat prisoners relatively humanely. Right. I mean, this is not, I mean, they're letting them call their moms. That's very humane. But the very, the fact that they are video recording it and mm -hmm. making that public is not, you know, a technical violation, the worst kind of violation um, or best kind. Yeah. Uh, did you see the video from, actually, I just saw it yesterday of the Russian uh, it wasn't a, a real tank. It was one of like a BTR-60 or something in one of their personnel carriers uh, destroying a civilian car driving down the road. It basically, yeah. apparently it was a, a couple in their 60s leaving and uh, as they're driving down a road, it, it was captured by a, um, a security camera on, a, on an adjacent building. Holy crap. Uh, and this uh, Russian vehicle comes around the corner and then just fires three shots directly into the civilian car, you know, obliterating it and, of course, killing the people. But that is, you know, direct conscious attack on civilians. Yeah, I think they just also, um, according to a post I just saw, they've uh, completely destroyed a maternity hospital in one of the cities yeah. as well. Right. Wow. Pushed into it, pushed into it by NATO aggression, no doubt. Yes. That was irony, by the way. Well, yes, yeah, you know, of course, actually, actually, actually the Ukrainian Nazis who, who blew up that maternity hospital and right. blamed it on the Russians. Yeah. Isn't uh, projection amazing? Evil people always do such massive projection. It's so... Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was Republicans years ago telling me that Obama wasn't going to give up power. I mean, it's just the same shit again and again. And a lot of these stories are, are cultivated, planted, and fueled, uh, fanned on purpose. I mean, this is very, yeah. extremely intentional. The, the idea that 50% of the country believes that the election was stolen and that the rightful president is not president right now is, is completely intentional. And, and was, that ground was prepared for a really nice long time. Yeah, this is the three-dimensional chess game that Putin's been playing now um, yeah. for a long time. And, and, and this is the, this is what it was for. Right. And so there's a whole theory that that um, nobody should ever have even had the notion that Moldova and Ukraine should be part of NATO. That that was a provocation of the Soviets, and that they, you know, that the Soviets many years ago were promised, "Hey, we're not going to go there," and then we just kept breaking that promise. How much weight do you put on, on that? It was something that um, Kissinger and George Shultz and you know, various folks in the late 90s uh, were warning about, uh, that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was talk about expanding NATO eastward. And so there were, there were warnings from the outset that the Russians, this, and this was pre-Putin, yeah. you know, the, the Russians would not uh, like that. So it's not outside the realm of reality for that to be an issue. Um, at the same time, these were not. This was not a, a case of uh, NATO forcing membership mm -hmm. onto these countries, and in no case does NATO forbid the the uh, leaving of NATO. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very different kind of situation than just simply we're going to, you know 
push up our version of the Warsaw Pact up against your borders. So the U.S. has a long and ignoble history of the moment Latin America um, elects somebody who's a little too left for the government, we overthrow them. And we've done this like dozens of times. It's like shocking how many times we've actually done this. And tried. Um, uh, and, and, and tried and failed with, with, with Castro. They, they tried to assassinate him, I don't know, 600 times or more or something like that. Uh, he finally, uh, man fi in El Salvador. Yeah. Man finally died of old age. Um, <laughs> But but our bends in Panama, I mean, there's this like really long litany mm -hmm. of times where in our back in our backyard, hey, look, um, the moment somebody gets too much looking like they're going to go lefty on us, we, we overthrow them. And so we're coming in saying, hey, you can't overthrow this country that was about to join the other side, which is, in fact, the heart of Russia, arguably the Kievan, uh, the Kievan Rus are, are sort of the, the Ur Russian folk and they come from Kiev. Yeah. Um, and so, so, hey, the heart of Russia is now going to join NATO seemingly voluntarily, but who knows what happened in election cycle after election cycle that was screwed up. So it's weird. Yeah, you well, know, I, I, I think oh, there is a, sorry, go on, Susan, go on. I do have a question for all of you. It's, it's uh, just to open it up. Um, uh, there's a new book out. Um, there are always a new book out. Anyway, one of the endless uh, <laughs> books on Merkel. And, wow. and, uh, and it turns out that, of course, had I thought about it for even just a second, I would realize that they actually knew each other. Is it called the Chancellor? Uh, called the Chancellor. Which the, I'm sorry, which they? Yeah, who knew each other? Putin and Merkel. Putin and Merkel. Oh, because yeah. Putin lived in what in East Germany. Yeah. Holy crap! Holy crap! Right, right. Yeah, right. and not he only spy, that, somewhere in this book, spy, just a second, I'll a, get the title of the book for you. He was a spy based in East Germany for what five or ten years. Yes, it's the Chancellor. Oh, crap. The, the Chancellor, the remarkable odyssey of Angela Merkel. And, and one of the stories that comes out of that book is that, um, is that the, this, the author thinks that this would not have happened as long as Merkel was Chancellor. Really? Mm. And it goes into some of the, the history there and it has more detail on, on, on you know, you know, what, what she thought of him and so on and so forth. Um, right. Fill us in, please. Fill us in, Susan. I don't can't. I haven't read it. Oh, okay. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not even going to, I just, it's just that I, in the conversation I had with, um, was actually with Esty, of course. Um, Esty. <laughs> and uh, at, uh, at Teddy's last birthday. Ah. And, um, but anyway, and so she, thought I should read it and I started to buy it and then I thought I don't want to know anymore. Right. <laughs> but, uh, we'll that's see. really that's really interesting. Yeah, then, I, I thought it was I mean it's not it's not a surprise once I once she said it and I thought she said, of course. I mean East Germany wasn't that big. Right. And if you were up if you were up in any of the yeah and she was leadership ranks you would have met. No. You would have met. Yeah they would have yeah. Um he was a. Uh, I don't seem to have the address. Of... What? The, the address? Oh, sorry. He was talking to Christine. Oh. Um, Jamey, you were also about to say something, which has now escaped your mind. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, just further pontificating. Uh, I, I do like the you know, mentioning Putin was KGB spying in, in or was in East Germany. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of Reagan's visit to Moscow with a young Putin there in the background, as if he's a, a father introducing his kids to to Reagan. No, I don't know <laughs> if it's ever been confirmed that it's Putin, but it's easy to find a lot of people claiming that it is. So, does this 1988 picture show Putin spying on Reagan? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how, how old is Putin now? Do we know? We can easily find out. Ages. Uh, Mr. Putin is uh, 69 years old. Nice. Not that old. Yeah. It's some well on the other side of 69. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a young chicken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but he was no I, more. Um, no, he was no more what? Go on. Uh, no more gregarious than he is now, <laughs> and very uh, not well, not terribly well spoken. He's never been a terribly good speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a uh, yeah. Well, I, I I do tend to think that anyone who points a gun at you is by um, by their very nature a very good speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, the uh, I I do think that there is a legitimate there is some legitimacy to the argument of uh, that having NATO right on the Russian border in an important part of the an important part of Russia is problematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, the the parallel of you know if if Mexico joined a um, security alliance with China, mm-hmm. we'd be rather nervous. We'd be nervous. Yeah. You know, yes, we've had we've had Cuba, ninety miles away or whatever it is from Florida for the past however many decades, but Cuba's tiny. Right. You know, Ukraine is the second yeah. largest country in your in Europe. Right. Yeah, and it's I mean. I was just reading today. Uh, somebody's recently published a history about uh, of wheat in Ukraine, and it's a it's a huge, huge wheat producer. It used to export a lot of it to the U.S. Uh, Egypt is basically going to starve at this point because they spend two and a half billion dollars on wheat from Ukraine every year. Mm. So they the micro the microprocessor industry is in trouble because the majority of neon used in neon lasers for chip production comes from Ukraine. I actually know quite actually know a few people um, who are in in business in the states who uh, have got large numbers of staff out in Ukraine doing software development and stuff. Yeah. So the the um, as some of you know that. Um, I have a Mennonite heritage and the Mennonites, uh, my father's family, uh, well, they brought wheat, the winter wheat, red, red, tur- turkey, red wheat to the U.S. Uh, from there. And they were they were invited by Catherine the Great to come and settle the Dnieper River and around there to uh, to actually grow wheat and grow big farms. Oh, and oh. they did. Hmm. And and so it turns out that that community there is uh, near Edessa. And, um, and the trait that I have, my great, great grandfather, great, great, great grandfather, all right, uh, was there, uh, was there for a time. And um, he, uh, and my cousin said that has, has been there. And he was a historian and he's been there and met a lot of the family that still is there. And, and, and has a, Send a message last week about how the tanks were coming through town. So, wow, that was it. Was as I said to myself. <laughs> suddenly, it seemed a lot closer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe, um, but that whole wheat thing is is an amazing story, and that's how that wheat eventually. So they came to Kansas. They came to um, uh, uh, they they left uh, in 1874. A big bunch of them, and again in 1917, but mostly mostly 1874, and they settled in Manitoba, and uh, in Kansas, and in Guadalajara, and in Paraguay, hmm. and that that whole that whole wheat belt is all, you know, much of it is not spring wheat; it's all winter wheat, and all the way up. Hmm. Super interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, and the, I have friends who. As I was growing up, who followed the harvest, they got out of school early and they went down to Texas with their family and just started working their way up all the way into Canada. You mean with the combines? Com- uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know if many people here understand that, Susan. That's, it's a pretty interesting thing. Those combines are in huge and expensive machines. Yes. And uh, so uh, they have these whole lines of them. They go and they just go harvest. And they're, they're it, it spread across the field and they just go whoosh. Well, see if you want to see something scary, you could you can go to um, a fair in Gossel, Kansas, once a year, and they bring out all of their old uh, the the prairie the machines that chewed up the prairie. Mm-hmm. Now those those are huge. I mean, mm-hmm. they're like the metal wheels that are you know a good twelve feet 
in diameter and uh and it just it just basically basically a spiral towed yeah. behind a big tractor that just chewed up the whole prairie yeah 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 right. they had to teach to stop the dust bowl they had to teach farmers how to farm differently yes and uh they did and my father lived through the dust bowl um in oklahoma mm -hmm. in oklahoma yeah so this anyway there were a lot of people there and the um i mean a lot of mennonites the whole string of us <laughs> uh there and uh i guess i was going to say that um i'm trying to think what i was going to say maybe i have a jamais problem here well this this interestingly sort of brings us in the proximity of bali and um Isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's Sort of does, you know. How do you how do you retrain farmers to do something slightly differently to change behavior, and how does that behavior trickle around? Right. Part of, part of what that video was that Susan uh, sent. Did anybody happen to see it? I watched it last night. Um, I, I don't know that we had enough warning to do it, but I uh, and let me put I, just for fun, let me put my notes about that video here on the shared screen. And so it's this, it's this guy, Stephen Lansing, who is the author of Perfect Order, which is a book we've mentioned several times on Rex Calls. Uh, Perfect Order is a study of uh, water allocation and rice farming on Bali and how the Green Revolution almost killed it off and how anthropologists went in and discovered that the thousand year old uh, rituals that were being held in the water temples in the Subox on the mountain of the volcano in Bali actually can uh, here i've got singing to the baby rice uh, contained algorithms for really ideal allocation of which fields should lie fallow when who gets how much water off the mountain etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and, and that was you, all and it was um, it was all uh the subak it was a it was basically an irrigation system and it was a a uh, yes and and they had they had optimized that for for quite a while um, the video, which you you should watch if you're interested in this sort of thing, is is quite a nice wrap for the book. Um, I think of it as bookends. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, the the his his march into the uh, area of complexity. He was at the set. Lansing was at the um, Santa Fe Institute. He has positions at Michigan and you know anthropology, uh, Michigan and. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, decades of research. Yeah. And and Bali and Borneo and the Malay archipelago, and is famous. And this is what I like is uh, for his socio so, so, social ecological modeling. Mm -hmm. But he says he asks. You know, they they did do a simulation, and they found the networks. Um, the networks then did self adapt self. They adapted, they programmed it sort of the way the uh, Tsubaks were working and they programmed it out. And sure enough, they were self, self organizing. The question was, what do you do with that self organization? Um, and you don't come in and do it top down, <laughs> uh, for sure. But the, the video does have an interesting example of getting even more, more into it. Um, yeah. yeah with you know complex adaptive systems and discovering that uh they, they um what was the name jerry do you remember the name of the model that the, the physicist i sure do i looked it up it's the icing model that's right named after ernst ising and wilhelm lenz who discovered it i don't know why lenz didn't get his name on the model but it's about ferromagnetism and statistical mechanics all of which I know nothing about. But what, what Lansing shows is that with a simple algorithm for how farmers can help optimize their behavior on their little plot of land, uh, the patterns in a, a subak in a, in, a, in a territory wind up resembling this icing model, which says that they wind up cohering. Uh, and he shows uh, satellite maps with you know, behavior over time that winds up creating larger clumps of patterns Right. That, that, that organize as a system instead of just local organization. And the thing that I didn't understand was when he shows the little algorithm, is that an algorithm that's from the temple rituals or is that a new algorithm that they recommended to the farmers? 
Oh, I think, uh, I think they didn't recommend an algorithm. I think they, they used the, the fact that this was true right. uh, to, to actually inform uh, the farmers that it would be okay that if they used less water, uh -huh. that comes into it. That's part of the sustainability sort of right. story. So if they use less water, they had higher increase. And the thing about the water was you, they, flood, they flood all those terraces. Um, and the timing uh, and the release of the water is controlled um, by the, at, at the point of the water temple for that, the subak that it's hosting. Right. And um, they, 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 that when they flooded the fields, what they were doing was getting the pests out. If you flood the field, even the mice and the rats, they all go, they drown. Mm -hmm. So uh, it took a huge amount of water to do that. And they discovered that they could get pest eradication with less water. Well, they also, he also discovered, he took, he took uh, <clears throat> metering equipment down, measuring equipment, and he discovered that flooding the patties released a whole bunch of methane. <clears throat> and then they that discovered, and, and then they discovered that that flooding the patties to a centimeter from the surface right. was sufficient to perform the task at hand and completely dramatically reduce the methane creation, because right. the anaerobic bacteria didn't start like like chewing things up and making methane. Um, and so then they had, and this is the part that I didn't quite get from from the thing. They had to convince the farmers to stop flooding the fields completely and yeah. to to start like going you know, only a, to a certain depth. Well, the surprise, the, I think the surprise, and that came out of the video, I believe, the surprise was that, that actually the, um, the having uh, less water also, that they didn't think that it would increase the yield, but it did. Right. That was the surprise. Doubled, that was probably the, the convincing thing for the farmers to think about exactly. adopting that. And Lansing says, you know, we, we were wondering how to convince people, but then it turns out that this better behavior doubled the yields. And then like, it was a downhill run from there. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this is about complexity in sustainability is like the frame for the whole talk. Yeah. And he's talking about how complexity theory seems to play out in these settings where you wouldn't expect them to. Yeah, and he said it's, and it's not chaotic. I mean, the, the sort of, he calls them mosaics, the patterns, which, reflect where the water where the water has been put you know where they are in the growing cycle etc right and all that was managed for thousands of years um and they got very good at it and and so when when the green revolution came in it just destroyed that the other thing that's not evident um in that video is the role that the, um, the water temples played uh, and the religious role that they play and the fact that it turned into, you could, you could, you could, um, you could, went to your subak, oh, on, on the fields. So there were these concave and convex things. So the valleys were convex, but the, um, the water temples had around them pools and everything else. So it was sort of, um, um, Concave. I mean, mm -hmm. con uh, yes. Concave, because yeah. they, they could hold water. They were. They could they hold were... water, and then that was what was released um, in through the weir um, at some agreed time and an amount. And oh, there's <laughs> in his in the book. Uh, I think it's an important thing. Part of the how do you get this to do? Get this to work. Um, too much paper. Um, mm. Okay, yeah. Then uh, here's the interesting question at the um, in the at the end of the book is do we gain anything by viewing water temple networks as complex adaptive systems? And the answer to that question is yes, again. Um, and the five things that they concluded from this long period of measuring, <laughs> measuring and talking to the people and working with the whole system, that networks can solve problems, that there's a progression from a local to global solutions, network structure matters, higher level control matters, 
they had that too. And the dynamics are not tied to the particularities of Bali. Um, so they can find this going on other places. The, um, what's, what's it, the, the religion there had the, um, there's a big gender story, which I'm not gonna go into, but the, the um, uh, it was it, the, the men and the women, masculine and feminine, and that goes into the, in the, the Hindu um, the, and the practice. Um, um, the Pradhana is about the creation of order and that's, that's what women do. And Pradhana aligns the role of women with the goddesses. So it, there's a whole religious layer to this. Mm -hmm. um, and the masculine is, uh, is, is the source of, uh, is a source of disorder, the source of order and disorder. And, but it's these, the masculine mm -hmm. and the feminine that come together Makes so much and, sense that men would be the source of disorder. Gosh. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, it wasn't. Yeah. No, I'm just saying. Yeah. And but they also play a role in creating order too, because that 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 hierarchy, the patriarchy, is uh, plays quite a role in in making those decisions as well. But then the women come in and um, create order, and what they do is they, they create discontinuities and then they resolve that discontinuities arise and then they resolve those by realigning the elements of, of the system. And it's quite an elaborate social system mm -hmm. over time. I just found a study about gender differences and metacognitive skills in Bali. Don't know, if yeah. it's, don't know if it's useful or not, but it's sort of along the lines of what you're talking about. So on the one hand, I'm sitting here thinking, it does the farmers no good to know that there's an icing model involved? And that's, a, that's like a light bulb going off for researchers. And yeah. they, want, they wander back and they're like, yeah, our models actually mirror reality. But it turns out that these rituals have been like functioning really quite well, thank you very much, without interference. But then, but then the, one of the insights that I expected you to list when you listed the five was, um, oh, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll send the URL. Um, uh, you're, you're right. Um, one of the insights I expected you to, to say was, hey, if we got cheap sensors in everywhere, we would help local farmers discover things they could tweak. And then using their algorithms and their community and, and sort of sharing out what's going on, they could find their way to better solutions on their own. Right. But they do find their way to better solutions on their own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the whole but they didn't the, find this one. Right. There's a subplot here of him taking this yeah. bulky equipment to measure methane output from plants yeah. uh, that wasn't local and that could be made cheaper. Like you, you right. could easily envision a very inexpensive way of measuring a methane exhaust from anything, just like I would love there to be. Um, so after the Fukushima earthquake, Joey Ito and others created open source Geiger counters. Yeah. Uh, and got those spread all over Japan so that they could get like crowdsource readings about radiation. Brilliant. Well, how about, would, yeah, that I sounds would, like such a good idea. Somebody must have thought of that. They did that. That's what happened after Fukushima. Um, no, I know, I know, I know, but I meant, I meant um, in soil and yeah, Bali. Soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the thing I would love to foster is soil organic matter readers that are insanely cheap and DIY and open sourced and whatever, and just propagate those around the earth. And then I'd love to change tax systems to reward anybody who improves soil organic matter and yeah. sharply penalize anybody who decreases soil organic matter. And I think a lot of other things would then shift around a bit because the incentives would be better aligned with regenerative agriculture and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And industrial farming would suffer. Like, like there'd finally be a tax on the, the pigs, the pig houses that, you know, and the chicken coops and all, all the, all the things that, that destroy the landscape and the earth. Yes, one would one would like. So I'm, I was just saying I'm going to. Well, I will look it up later. Yeah. But my my guess is there are there are people who have that you know handheld <laughs> simple to use DIY uh, methane meters. But I I was looking for um, uh, I was looking for sensors for a uh, mm -hmm. uh, propane. Methane or propane? Propane. Propane, okay. Okay. Anyway, I wandered into this whole world of sensors. Oh, cool. And it is really difficult. 
and those the sensors that can sense a gas in the middle of all the other gases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is okay. is a pretty tricky thing to do. Mm -hmm. Not to say it can't be done or hasn't been done. You yeah, think, you think that the the bong industry would be really good at propane research, but still. <clears throat> yeah, well, it is. Uh, yeah, I just had a new water system put in. Mm. And uh, in my up here, and uh, and I have a propane heater, which is just gobbles propane. I mean, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> but I wanted to know if it was leaking, mm -hmm. if if the new water heater, which was on demand, was leaking propane, and and you can you can buy widgets. They're not all that rare. They're, they're not terribly expensive, but they are. It's a lot safer. It's a lot safer than walking around the device with a lighter. Much safer than that. <laughs> well, or or actually soapy water, you know. Yeah. I use soapy water, but then you have this mess. You have this huge mess of soapy water all over your body. Exactly. Pot. Exactly. Whatever. Anyway. So anyway, any Jamei Bo, any thoughts from the Bali stuff for sustainability plus complexity or, or all that? And Jamei, I'm remembering a lot uh, your talks about RK dynamics uh, and ecosystems and how those apply to our doomed futures and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been, you've been in these waters for a long time as well. I'm listening. Uh -huh. um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see the link to the video until late, so I didn't get a chance to watch it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm listening uh -huh. and I, I don't want to Get, let my mouth get ahead of my brain. And Lance, yeah, Lansing, is anyway. Lansing is lovely. I, I'd never seen a picture of him, so I'd read Perfect Order years ago, and I had no idea from him. It's just nice to hear him talk. Yeah. And he's very, he's very, you can tell he's kind and thoughtful, and he, he gives credit where credit is due. Yeah. So he'd be the last person to take credit for all of this, uh, all of these insights, but he's very open to you know, I mean, the Santa Fe Institute is no, is, is a really interesting place. Well, I wonder cool. how well these methodologies, these very old, very well-tested methodologies will work in a changing climate environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, changing, you know, changing timing and amounts of rainfall. Yeah. Um, changing temperatures uh, and where, thing, where, thing, where things will happily grow. I mean, there's uh, right. home ranges, I guess, is what it's called uh, for so various how, kinds how of animals and insects. How amenable is this process to evolution? Does it evolve well, or is it very much a product of its environment? It, it's, uh, I mean, when he says, the dynamics are not tied to the particularities of Bali. Um, uh, I read that to mean also that the implication was that this kind of social ecology, that's what I, I would call it, that social ecology, um, is, is a process that go, goes on and is the, adapt, is the adaptive process for people. Okay. Uh, and we, can, we mess it up. Uh, as well as, 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 you know, adjusting to it. But it's the incremental changes and the fact that, of course, I think that's a really an outstanding question is how fast can things adapt? I'm surprised. I'm surprised at all the changes that have been here in the 35 years I've lived here. The bugs are different. Mm -hmm. I miss swatting away flies and mosquitoes. Like I, I have not been surrounded by flies and mosquitoes now for decades. Yeah. And I'm like, where the hell did they go? What's going on? Yeah. And mosquitoes, of course, are, yes, mosquitoes are, uh, you know, food for a lot, of, a lot of things. As we are willing food for them. Yes. Um, sort of pivoting a little, uh, Jamey Bo, any, any interesting things in your, in your worlds? Any things that are like, whoa, what's this? Uh, I'm just kind of worried about World War. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I said to, to <laughs> I said uh, when Jerry suggested that 
I said, I've been working on this, you know, digging around to see what I can find out about this guy and what he's done and how, how where it went. And, um, and he said, well, why don't we talk about that? And then, and then you sent out your, your thing about the war. And I sent a message back saying, oh, I forgot the book. I forgot the war. And it was just to realize that I had been so engaged in this, you know, trying to pull this big picture and get it wrangled into a story or two, um, that, that I was relieved of that for a time. Sorry. <laughs> I would recommend, you know, get a really deep thing that you have to figure out. Yeah, exactly. Spend a day on that because it clears the mind. It doesn't help, it comes right back, but it's for a time there, you're, you're left in peace. Have you all heard of constructor theory? I've heard of it. Um, so let me put a, I had a really fascinating conversation yesterday about constructor theory. Uh, let me paste also an explanation, which is not the best explanation, but it's a reasonable one for now. And let me share screen. <clears throat> and, and the conversation started with this idea of scaffolding. And, and um, Susan, I have this idea that you're, you're going to really like constructor theory. Uh -huh. um, and it's kind of like information has a cost. I, I'm, I'm not going to explain this well, but I'm going to explain it better than I was able to explain it yesterday. Um, that information has a cost and the constructors uh, create, um, oh, there's a nice graphic somewhere that I'm forgetting about now, uh, that, that depend on scaffolding and substrates. They use substrates so that when we, uh, when we write a report and leave it out in cyberspace, that's kind of a, uh, a substrate. Boy, I'm explaining it really poorly. <clears throat> um, and it's connected to ergodic theory uh, and ergodicity, which uh, comes from dynamical systems theory, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm forgetting exactly who's guilty of creating ergodicity. Um, but I realized, I realized that when I use the metaphor of leaf cutter ants and the big fungus to describe me and the brain and open global mind, and let me rewind for a second to explain that. So, um, I'm, I think I've said this several times here, but leaf cutter ants can't digest leaves. Why are they bringing leaves into the nest? They hand those little leaf cuttings off to a subgenre of that kind of ant, which mulches up the leaves, puts them on a fungus, which they have a symbiotic relationship with under, underground in the nest. That fungus metabolizes leaf matter and oozes fungus parts and nectar, which feeds the entire hive. Yeah. Metaphorically, as I curate my brain and add stuff to it, I feel like I'm gardening this fungus. I feel like I'm curating a fungus, which is nutritious to a few people because there are a few hardy souls who send me messages to say, hey, thank you for publishing your brain. I always go look in it first when I, you know, when I have to research something or I found this and you didn't have this, could you add it? And I do and like blah, blah, blah. That happens a little bit on the side all the time. But it, it struck me in conversation yesterday that my big fungus analogy for me curating this uh, information source and wanting, so I think of myself as a lone ant at the fungus space for 24 years because the brain is not a good collective intelligence tool. There is a team brain version, but it doesn't actually work the way it needs to work. Um, but I feel like where the hell is everybody else? This is really fun. We should be creating a shared memory together. This is just an awesome task. And we don't all have to be using the brain. We could be using different tools that connect in to create this scaffolding for how we think, yeah. right? And that's where it connects back up into constructor theory because it's like, oh my God, Wendy. And Wendy Elford is the woman that, that and Pete Kaminsky, who you all know. Um, so Pete and Wendy were on a call with me that went like more than an hour and a half about this because she runs incredibly deep on this. She's highly trained in Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework and sense maker mechanisms and all that. And so she's been using that to help Kinevin Australia create stuff around water and it, like it runs into indigenous wisdom and a bunch of other really interesting things. Um, I know, I know. Uh, but you know what? A, a couple little ants working steadily over time create stuff, right? Mm -hmm. so that's the thing. Do you want to break into song? <laughs> no, I'll pass. Okay, good. I mean, I, I, I it's like one of those moments in the musical where you go from from prose to sing to song, right? Yeah. 
I, I'm sorry, my brain goes in weird directions. That's great. My, my brain is ineffable. It's what we love about you, Jume. It's among many other multitude. among many other virtues um but anyway there's this idea an open global mind was born from this frustration i have that i've been sitting here with a quirky yeah, fuel yeah, yeah. weaving curating gardening by myself making topiary out of ideas which i find incredibly useful and other people are like Meh, not sure i get it and well, i completely get it but i can't do it <laughs> Well, partly I'm like, there's, if there were, the Wikipedia was not created by everybody on earth going and making an entry. No. Wikipedia was created by a couple of manic obsessives doing really good work together. And yeah. then this crowdsourcing dynamic where lots of other people came in and said, you know, I'm gonna fix the Oxford commas and you know, I'm gonna fix uh, usage and citation uh, processing and whatever, awesome. But a, a few tens of thousands of people gave us Wikipedia. A few tens of thousands of people obsessive like me could give us a substrate above Wikipedia and Google that actually weaves together what people are thinking and where it comes from and why. And we need that scaffolding. We need that structure, that substrate, that, that conversational anchoring so that we're not having the same conversations over and over and over and over fruitlessly um, so that we have a shared memory that other people can lift higher from Etc. And then I'm starting to see books and PDFs as little prisons for interesting ideas. Like what, what our smartest people do is they write books. And then what do we do with books? We wrap them in DRM and we put them out there and we spank people <clears throat> who de debrief, decode, decipher what's in the book and disseminate it because it might actually be useful information for the world. Right? And PDFs make it hard to sort of use information. PDF, I'm one of the people who believes PDF is where information goes to die. Um, and so, so we, we're taking great ideas and we're not amplifying them and making them more useful and usable, bless you. Um, we're actually locking them away and making it harder to fix the problems that we're all facing. Bless you again. I intercepted it, I got it. No, no, ah, okay. Oh, there's another one coming. Are you, are you a three sneezer? Okay. I met someone once who was like a seven or a nine sneezer. And it was really funny because she'd start sneezing and, be like, choo, 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 and you'd be like, <laughs> until she was done. And then, and then it was gone, but it was predictable. The number was predictable. Uh, so anyway, that's my rant on, on, on all of this and scaffolding and fungi. So I own the big fungus.org but I haven't done much about it. But the idea is let's all, and it's because it's tongue in cheek, let's all go feed the big fungus. Because if we do this properly and tend symbiotically to our information commons and information resource, Mike is back, yay. Um, if we tend to this resource together well, we might actually advance civilization. Because I've got high hopes, I've got Well, one of the things that I, <laughs> Mike, you might want to leave again. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I, that's what I came back for. And while you were gone, we took psilocybin, all of us. <laughs> we're, we're, we're basically tripping. Well, you were going to say but one of the, I, I think one of the things that seems to me to be missing is a, a, a match or a, I mean, I, I don't know, once a match between the social ecology and these things, right? I mean, he's Somewhere? the first, this anthropologist that, you know, he's very close to doing that, of having the social system and the, and the actual social ecology, they're, they're merged. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he brings them together it, as a- How was that a, not actually originally happening in Bali before the Green Revolution showed up. How was that not already a thing on the ground? Where the it's already a thing on the ground, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's the story, it's the meta story that I'm thinking about. Okay. Okay. As you know, how does change happen? Because I've been messing around in that space for ages. Um, and one of the examples that I keep going back to is um, uh, I used it here once uh, the uh, Cuyahoga. River burning. The fire, lit, lit on fire? It lit on fire, yeah. And uh, and to go back, and I read enough 
to um, substantiate my <laughs> to substantiate my hypothesis, which is that what you need for these kinds of things is uh, I will confess as a researcher because you know, you're not supposed to do that, um, but we all do. Uh, was um, was that it was what was important there? It took fifty years to clean up the river. Okay, and when they celebrated it, it became obvious to me that what worked was a shareable, a shareable, uh, a shareable idea. And the shareable idea was they all wanted clean water, but they wanted it for very different reasons. So, you know, the people who, there were the, there were the people who brought their boats through, they wanted to be able to get, you know, shipping channels be clearer. They wanted, uh, the fishermen wanted to be able to fish again. The, um, all those- Interna International symbol for fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They wanted to fish. They wanted to, to uh, you know, go swimming. They wanted all of these different things for different reasons. But it all, it all came together under the rubric of clean water. That was never a decision. It was never, I couldn't find any place. Well, I didn't go that deeply, but couldn't, didn't, it didn't jump out from the stuff that I was reading. Mm -hmm. that, 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 was, that was the driver. Um, and so this idea of a shareable, a shareable uh, purpose yeah. is more important than shared. Because if you try to distill it into something everybody's going to agree to, that is just hopeless. Yeah, yeah. You can't reach you can't reach consensus. And and that's why team brain, for example, doesn't really work, is that it kind of requires consensus on what's being added across people. And why OGM doesn't think that the brain is the answer, but there's like a half dozen or a dozen different kinds of ways of visualizing information that yeah. need to that need to meet in the middle someplace. And the tools need to collaborate, but also the, the the substrate the scaffolding needs to permit each individual to express their own point of view and then blend it into the larger point of view where they see fit so so i one of the reasons i love the brain is that it just it holds my point of view it's not claiming to be anybody else's point of view but if i were to trip across a web of ideas that jamay has written about our case succession and how that affects what we should do about the climate i could link into that and say in this area, Jamais speaks for me and speaks for these 62,323 other people who said, this cluster of ideas is really fantastic and we're behind it. And that, that's the way that, because otherwise all you get is, you know, uh, eight point, however many, I don't know how many humans are on earth right now, but, you know, billion different versions of reality. If you start to figure out where the overlaps are and how to crystallize and connect and agree on small subsets individually, then you start to get this collective uh, thing. Oh, I didn't realize there may have to go. Um, but does that make sense? It does. I, I just to be uh, throw in a sort of slightly contrarian spanner here, if I may. Um, it does seem to me that uh, we have this very, very long, deeply embedded adversarial concept about knowledge and thought structures and stuff like that, which makes it extremely difficult to arrive at consensus. So, for example, as um, the guy who wrote um, about metaphor said, George, George Lakoff. that's it, Lakoff. Lakoff and Johnson, in 1980 this was, when they were talking about how actually most of metaphor, most of the metaphors which we use to talk about discussion are all taken from war in Western culture. Hmm. Nearly, nearly every single one of them. And one of the things that I found really interesting was that when I actually run metaphor workshops, which actually require people to translate what they what they are thinking or what they're doing into a metaphorical journey through a landscape they all start well first of all they all start having fun secondly they all start going oh you know what yeah that metaphor that you came up with that's kind of like that's kind of like a bit that fits into another bit of my metaphor over here 
And people who were originally thought that they were going to completely disagree with each other because they have their own particular agendas when they're thinking with their left brain suddenly find that they've got common cause and they end up with a picture of a journey that they can all take together. So I think there's something really valuable in recognising that we're, we tend to be inherit this bias in how we try and process this stuff. And I think... It... <laughs> yes, and I think, it, I think... What an image. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you mean the fecal metaphor kind of plant? <laughs> so, uh, yes, when I was uh, building uh, the Institute for Research on Learning, um, and we had this motley crew of, you know, my experience at CSLI at Stanford had been that everybody liked being in this interdisciplinary, you know, stew for the first mm -hmm. year. And then when the second year came around, um, and you got more further into what people were actually thinking, and what they were actually working on, vehement disagreement <laughs> would, 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 would surface. And so uh, I, uh, I thought for the, the Institute, and I, and I think what I like about the, uh, the metaphor, using that metaphor, I can imagine, I can imagine the building was that I said, okay, every, you split everybody up into groups in which we had both administrators. We actually split ourselves up in the building so that the administrators were, were in, in among us to hear the conversations. Oh, that's great. And when yeah. the, when the, um, when the, um, when the uh, one of the soci sociolinguists uh, was sitting next to the uh, HR person, she said, I had no idea what went on in there or what the work was. I mean, what, yeah. what, what it was and just being in the hallway and overhearing things and so on and so forth. So we, much of the time we would um, recommend uh, that they just redistribute the people there's all these interesting stories about building planning and for, for interaction, including, yeah. was it Oxford or Cambridge, where the departments would be centered around stairwells? Yes. Instead of being, this floor is English, they'd yeah. be like, no, 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 English is around this stairwell up and down. And then the, the movement up and down the stairwell was a part of the social interaction. Because they don't, otherwise they don't, you know, I mean, the, there was, what's his name, Tom at MIT, Tom, I'll think of it. Malone. Who, uh, Malone. Yeah, uh, you know the research on people don't go up up the stairs. You know they don't go they don't mesh on floors. But on the other hand, I had a big argument with Genentech about um, and uh, the design of these big stairways that come down at, to a hub, and I wanted to see what was going on, who was talking with whom on the stairways, because we used to video that at Send Microsystems, because hmm. they wanted to know how. They wanted us to recommend what collaborative technologies they should use. I said, what do you know about collaboration in this company now? Okay, and the collaboration of course was very tied to hallways. Uh, and and at, you know, and in the morning, everybody would be looking into each other's rooms to see who was there. Um, we called that glancing like this. I mean, you could just see them going, seeing who's there, can they step in, not. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, they were all sort of done and they'd come out and stand in the hallways and talk. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was the timing of it, the rhythm of it. Uh, and then who talked to whom? So we, we did, some people wouldn't play, but most, most of the people didn't mind being videoed and actually looking at who knew whom. You know, had they worked together before and you didn't, you got elevator behavior, but among people who didn't know each other or hadn't worked together. And uh, and a very powerful we, uh, part of the thing I always insisted on was that that we find situations that were working the way we wanted them to work. So if we you know if somebody was going to take all the insurance agents out of you know out of uh, out of their offices and have them work remotely, you know how was that? How were you going to replace that? <laughs> replace those kinds of things because that was it, the, the scaffolding in your in the, the sort of metaphorical scaffolding that you're talking about is very real in a building and putting people next to each other and working next to each other 
and, and finding, you know, there was one person who was assigning projects to the, in, in, in the, in the morning and, and actually would say, go sit next here, here, you've got this kind of a, was, was actually building a scaffolding plan for each person in the room mm -hmm. as to how, who, what they needed to learn, what kinds of cases. And she would distribute the cases and say, go sit next to so-and-so, you'll need this. Um, it's very powerful. It is. Uh, anyway, so we did, so for, I had, I decided to, it's, it's also useful to the way Mike was talking about giving people a metaphor, <laughs> a job to come up with metaphors. Uh, I wanted them to come up with a floor plan for, um, or a plan for how the, the Institute would look in five years if we could build a building. And, oh, that's great, yeah. And, and <laughs> you know, and they got, they really got in there. And the funny thing was we had five groups and uh, all of them came up with the same idea. Some version of mobile office, you know, some people had that had little caravans that you could, you know, ring, ring, and then you could go park next to somebody else and, uh, and various, various wonderful things like that. So there was this complete desire to want to collaborate. It's really interesting. Yeah. And so that, you... that's another thing of um, building, all right? You know, it, it has to be, people have to build things together. Right. The so only how... way we got the computer scientist and the anthropologist to work together and stop arguing uh, was to send them to a client together when the right, director right. and I couldn't go. Did they also stop arguing? Did they also stop arguing when they started working on visualizing what their different yeah. architectural structure would yes. look like? Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. That yeah. makes perfect sense. I mean, our, our friend Dave Gray makes his entire living out of out of helping people to get past um, serious. Uh, strategic problems by making them draw them out yeah yes yes yeah. changing the medium right <clears throat> can can actually uh induce that but you have to feel like you don't have to know all about the medium in order right. to participate. Yeah, yeah. so so a couple things here one i clearly believe in turning decisions over to locals to figure things out like open space technology and a bunch of design from trust I also believe that it's really hard sometimes for people to get out of their ruts or out of their preconceptions. And one of the lessons of drawing on the right side of the brain, um, uh, if any of you ever read that, Betty Edwards back in the day, um, she has you draw uh, an image and you, you sort of draw it. And then she has you turn the image upside down and draw it. And when you draw it right side up, when you get to the ear, you're like, oh, your brain hops in and goes, oh, I know how to draw an ear. You do this, and then you do this, and there's an ear. Look, it looks like an ear. And when you turn it upside down, you're merely drawing shapes and shadows. And, the, mm -hmm. and, and when you draw shapes and shadows and ignore what your brain knows about an ear, you draw much more accurate representation of what's in front of you. So in, in planning a building for ourselves or whatever, I'm reminded of my household in West Philly, my second year in grad school. Um, uh, I found the house. I told the I told the students the year before that we're leaving. Don't, don't offer this to anybody else. I got this. And then I recruited <coughs> some buddies. And there were five guys in a six bedroom, big home in West Philly. And one of us had had a really interesting household at York University in Canada. And he said, what we did was not, this is my shelf in the fridge, this is your shelf in the fridge. We divided up the household into what each person was really good at. So Raphael and I were meats, vegetables, fresh stuff, because we knew how to shop. One other guy was dry goods, cleaning products, toilet paper, make sure the house is always full of that. One guy was the banker, he was busy calculating how much we were spending and then telling us how much we had to put in the drawer the next for the next month. This is way before everything is credit cards. So a cash drawer was fine and we yeah. luckily didn't get robbed. And so we split up the tasks and then the fridge, if you really wanted something personally, you put your name on it and you put it somewhere, but the fridge was then an organic fridge. And like that insight from one person in our group who had had a really high functioning yeah. household in New York infected our entire household yeah. and we had a, we had a lovely year because of this we also had a uh, the house book was by the only telephone in the house which was uh, you know on, on the ground floor at the base of the stairs and we used to leave funny messages for each other tease each other and leave hey so and so called for you you know our voicemail equivalent was in the book uh that was in the in the house 
And yeah. one of the boxes that I have to sort through right now contains that book, which I'm, I'm actually eager to find again. But, but I'm saying all of this because we have all these preconceptions for how to do stuff. And when left to go, like, go design yeah. what you want the building to look like, we will really often fall back on the ruts. And it's like, oh, let's put the anthropologist over there and the, you know, the aquarium designers over here. But any one of these little hacks, when told, will hook in our brains and be, yeah. and, and this is why pattern languages are so useful is that a good pattern language will make these little other sorts of insights memorable and will put them into play in the design process. And so a piece of what I think is necessary for, for catalyzing positive change is telling lots of stories of interesting, quirky things, translating as much of the wisdom from those stories into a pattern language that you can then start using to talk um, because you need to talk at a higher level. And that's what pattern language lets you do. Um, and we're not doing all of that. So sorry, long, long screed, but, but I love the idea of having people design things in order to change metaphors, in order to rethink the social engineering or social ecology of their spaces, but they need a little bit of stimulus to do so. Right. But I mean, I think, think the premise of, uh, I think we were about five years in before we had that little exercise. Um, but I think people were struck by what they had. Right. I'm having an urge to do a Zoom call with my buddy Raphael and have this conversation again. Yeah, it's a... Uh... But again, it was, I mean, notice the dynamics, the, the dynamics, the social dynamics of, you know, expertise. I mean, my, my partner that I built this place with uh, and I desperately tried to not fall into gendered roles. And in the end we had to, because, I mean, we shared a lot. I remember, you know, when we, when I finally understood triangles in the abstract, uh, we needed to figure out how, where to put the water tank up the hill, how far up did we need to put it to get 35 PSI? Well, I had no idea how to do that. And then he said, well, oh, of course you do. Those are okay. So we went out and walked off the steps, walked up and, you know, it happened. But time, you know, I would do, end up doing the cooking and he and cleaning, and he would end up doing the, doing the, um, all the calculations for the working drawings. I'm loving this. Institutes, houses. Mm -hmm. All of that. Taking expeditions to the North Pole. We didn't go to the North Pole. We went as far as the Arctic Ocean and stuck our feet in it. But that was pretty good, nice. So what were you saying? Uh, you're muted still. I was saying I was enjoying the sound of the birds in the background. Is oh, yeah. Or Susan? I can hear them. Yeah, OK, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm enjoying that. And also the fireplace behind Mike. What yeah. is that, Mike? Yeah, there are birds outside my window, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you how long I spent making that fireplace, but I did. Nice. It would be sort of strangely fitting in this conversation if there was a bird roasting over your fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, no bird roasting over my fire today. Well, I have a, I have a fire as well, but it's a propane fire. Is yours a propane fire or is it a wood fire? It's a wood fire. Yeah, oh. it's a it's a wood burning fire. Is the top of your stove a cooktop? Can you actually cook on that, or is that just a heating stove? Yeah, you can if you really, really want to. I don't know if I'd necessarily advise it. It's pretty difficult to control the temperature. Yeah, it's great, sure. for keep, great for keeping toast hot on there. You could you could heat a, a kettle of water. Yeah, you could, but it'll take a long, long time. Yes, it does. <laughs> I used to live with a wood stove. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I just use it for heat. But, well, you know, the Vermont castings in a big open space, I mean, you can actually heat a volume of what of air hmm. with the Vermont castings. 
And there's no shortage of wood here. Now that everything's dying, we've plenty of wood. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I think that maybe it's not a bad thing to have uh, one solid fuel mm -hmm. form of heating at the moment, eh? Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, Bo, um, yes. is the economic situation going to go right down the shitter, or what do you what What's your take on where all this stuff is taking us? The the biggest danger. So right now, our one of our problems is uh, the Fed trying to kill inflation, raising interest rates when the economy is starting to slow down. Mm -hmm. So this is actually not uh, optimal. <laughs> yeah, this is really not optimal. And um, so they talk about policy error, and that's what they're talking about is how how the Fed's going to soft land the economy. Uh, the other point is is that I think there's a lot of uh, contention about whether this is supply chain problems that are causing this inflation. Well, that's not all of it, but again, does monetary policy deal with supply chains? Uh, no, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Europe, Europe right now is the big danger because, um, Mike, how likely do you think it is Europe's going to say we're not going to buy any more um, oil or natural gas from Russia? How likely is that? I, I well, I... I think that um, oh God, it's really difficult to tell, isn't it? Because at uh, the moment, so much of it is like is like bravado. So Germany's saying that they're going to try and cancel almost all of it, and I think they actually. But I think Germany probably will because they actually have some kind of plan for doing it, right? But Germany's shut down a whole bunch of functioning nukes, which seems yeah. But I think they're going. Really I think they're actually considering reopening them. Yeah. That's what I would do. I would. I would. And a bunch of other stuff. If you, if you have healthy functions, I, don't shut them down. And I do. I. I think the UK. I think the UK is absolutely useless. Don't expect to see any any shred of integrity or 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 uh, ideologically genuinely ideologically motivated behaviour from out of the UK. They're all in Russia's pocket anyway, as far as I can make out, pretty much. Okay, so the the big the biggest next danger is Europe decides to stop. Um, using Russian fuel and oil, gas and oil, mm -hmm. then you've got a, a 70s style like supply shock. And uh, it's not, now, unlike the 70s, we use about a quarter less oil and gas to produce stuff. So it's not as bad as that. Right. That kind of supply shock to Europe will really hurt them. And Europe's not really doing that well right now anyway. They, unlike us, our policymakers did such a good job in our uh, through the pandemic of pumping money in everybody's hands. Europe didn't do that. Um, Europe is not even back to trend. We are back to trend. Mm -hmm. So another way of saying this is Europe's already weak. And if they take that supply shock, it's going to really hurt. And, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, I see them as the most vulnerable, actually, right now of really getting hurt. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, I think that they will. There will be a supply shock in europe regardless of what the regardless of what people say i i think it will be just impossible for them to completely go back to the russian relying on russian energy because it's just now absolutely clear to everybody what a completely stupid thing it was to do i mean you know i've been saying for the past 15 years excuse me how about how about like focusing or hugely investing in renewables, local generation, thorium, uh, reactors, uh, local grids, network local grids, loads of resilience to any terrorist attack or anything else, safe nuclear energy, blah, 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 blah. <sighs> Might as well not have wasted my breath, really. <laughs> So shocking that Merkel, I mean, the way the Germans shut down all the reactors. But I also heard, heard that one of the things that really pushed from a for German friend of mine is that uh, the Black Forest was full of a lot of stuff from Chernobyl. All oh, right. Um, not only Fukushima, Fukushima it was uh, basically the experience of that. Like and, zombies and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, what's funny is there's France with the other 7% of their power from nuclear reactors. I mean, France is going to walk through this pretty well, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they I think they will. I think they'll probably go through it okay. The UK is going to be completely completely screwed um, because now we're not even in the European uh, Energy Buying Consortium. Right, right. There's a, just a shitstorm waiting there. But also, like like Egypt buys 
almost $3 billion worth of wheat from Ukraine every year. Now that's happening. And the thing about wheat is, and that's, that's great that um, Susan's here, is that you, America has enough capacity to completely fill in the missing wheat. But problem is, you needed to plant it last year. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. So. Well, and a lot of those, you know, a lot of the, the wheat growing um, areas are, um, have gone back to grass. I mean, because we thought we didn't need that much, right? Remember when there were um, farm subsidies? Yeah. I mean, the farm subsidies are going like gone. Are they? I thought we still had lots of subsidies like in the farm bill, like tobacco, like we're paying tobacco farmers to not grow tobacco and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was still still baked in. And I'm, I could be entirely wrong. Okay. Some of it, some of it for the for the small farmers, yeah. not so much. Yeah, for nothing good happens for small farmers. Like we we torture small farmers, but it's about big business. Forget yeah, but 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 agri, you know, the industrial farmers get all sorts of like interesting, juicy, yeah. socialist kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. It's, the ironies, the ironies are so deep. I read I read Cadillac Desert, uh, which is about water in the West in America. Oh. And you know the, the the middle of the country where the high the high plains west of the Mississippi where really you shouldn't be growing crops a lot have lots of crops they're part of the breadbasket because of irrigation and they're getting they're getting water that caught that they're paying um, twenty dollars an acre foot for water that costs like two hundred dollars an acre foot to get to them yeah uh, shit like that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so we'll see. Well, the other thing I, I don't know, you know, I, I actually think I, I think there will be shocks, but I think that it may be incredibly so there may be some incredible surprises about how people adapt. Yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the here here, the you know, we have PG&E in California, Pacific Gas and Electric, right, which is not servicing the population very well at all. And they're burning down everything. Yep. And uh it's, it's just ridiculous. Anyway, so what's happening here in this little pocket that I live in, um, between the ocean and the bay, um, there's a town called La Honda, which has been in blackout so many times. And they don't, they say, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to, over the last couple of years, they put them in blackout over and over and over. Wow. So partly because of fire uh, danger. So and they don't tell them when they're going to do it. And then they put in these, never mind. I don't want to go into it. It's caused the town of La Honda to decide to put in a microgrid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, I just put in new solar and the company that um, did it was doing, this is his first, one of their first off grid. I'm off the grid, have been off the grid for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And some people are just terrified by it. And, uh, I'm liking I'm you're really an old hand those new panels and I'm just liking the sun shining and having power. I mean, it's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. Um, and all your manual, you know, so Susan, every morning and evening had to go throw throw switches at the battery bank and stuff like that to yeah. decouple the inverter or whatever. I don't remember yeah. what just just to have the cycle work every day. Yeah. And that and now that's gone. I had I had 19 electrical boxes. And now I have like, I have one uh, Tesla gateway plus um, a couple boxes for distribution. And now there's an app for that. Yeah, there's an app for the te te Tesla gateway. Although I cool? almost had to go down and restart the solar panels, but we decided it was because, oh, so my lesson, the lesson I have learned from this thing is that they did not think through what it was like to, uh, come up to an existing uh, electrical system. You know, how far do you push into that system? How far do you, you know, replace things? How far do you, whatever? And I've had, it's been a huge learning curve for me to debug. So it took me about two seconds this weekend to figure out that the reason that the, the mm. Siberian couldn't get the pumps that diesel uh, on Sunday, which is the day to pump diesel, um, which we now went a whole month on was, and so the, the battery died. Oh. And uh, it took me, and, I, and the battery died. I mean, <laughs> and to discern that the battery had died uh, 
didn't take it was it was it had been purchased in 2017 and this is the thing that starts the generator we hadn't been running the generator so it hadn't been charged it was also getting old and uh it took it took two catastrophes when the um the tesla power wall went down because we used up all the power and if i had been paying attention but i wasn't because it had two sunny days in a row and i'm thinking wow we're said we're we're in heaven here <laughs> but we weren't because that when the uh you know, when the generator wasn't running because it didn't turn on, it was supposed to automatically turn on, but I didn't know it hadn't turned on. So you have, I think, what one could call a low IQ grid uh, as opposed to a smart grid, but you're heading yes. toward a smart grid. Yeah. But right now you have kind of like a dunderhead grid. Yeah. We could call it a dunder grid. A dunder grid, yes. A dunder grid. Anyway, at least the Siberian thanked me. He said, you've got that fixed really promptly. I had to drive down to the Bayside and get the yeah. whatever and get bit battery and bring it up here. I couldn't even lift the damn thing for the generator. And I had to call my, my fix it person to come over and put it in. Um, I'm, um, I'm looking at the time and I, I actually have another uh, two people showing up at the half hour uh, for a different call. Um, and that call yeah. I'm, I was going to solicit your help also. I'm trying to stand up, pick Jerry's brain as a way to make a living. And so if you would stare at that and uh, any comments, welcome. Um, because I'm trying to figure out like, hey, can I actually, and it's, it's complicated in several different ways, but um, I love sitting and brainstorming with people while using both my, both my brains. So why not get paid for that? Uh, well, then, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you can try that. That's great. Yeah. So, so anyway, so I'm, I'm uh, about to head off and try to do that. And um, I did a couple of test calls. So I have a couple of Picturious Brain prototype calls, one of which you can find pointed to from that website. And the second person that I did it with sent just yesterday sent me back a bunch of really interesting, like detailed comments, which were beautiful. Like he really took time and, and made comments. And he also said, you know, Jerry, if, if the call is going to be 60 minutes or 90 minutes, I kind of have to prep for an hour. Then afterward, if I'm going to take this seriously, I need to listen to the call again. Yeah. And then yeah. I need to do some self-work. And so I, my, my investment on my side, he said, is like five or six hours, realistically, if I take this seriously. And I'm like, you are completely right. And, and, and that I could take that two different directions. One is, why don't I play that up and say, hey, to actually do this properly, you're going to need five or six hours. And here's a template for what you could do with that time, how you could go through it. And that, I think, is actually added value to what I bring to it. Um, or that means I should skinny down the, the length of time that I spend with them. And uh, someone said that Venkatesh Rao was selling like six, his time in six minute increments, kind of as a joke, but kind of as a serious thing. And I can't find that any place. So um, that's interesting too. Like I could just jam with a bunch of different people for an hour. I could do 10 people in an hour in six minute increments. Maybe I should do that. I have yeah, but no getting idea. the pra getting yeah. that pra the practice of actually doing that extra five or six hours is no joke. I mean, we, yeah. we had to build that at the Institute for the, Anthropo the, the Collaborative Anthropology. They don't work together. And we had, we had, and we had to process one hour of field work was five or six hours of work. So wait, so the collaborative anthropologists weren't collaborating? They didn't know how. That's amazing, but it makes total sense. It, of course it does. Yeah, and it, it, it's ironic in a funny way. And we had, it, it, it's completely ironic. It's, everybody said, I don't understand what they're doing and they're just going out and observing. Well, everybody can observe, right? So yeah. that's the big deal. And I think it's not that, it's the analysis. Yeah, I think if you wanna, if you want to get the mother of all disagreements going, get a bunch of experts about the same thing and put them in one room. Yes, and I, I just don't do that anymore. It's so <laughs> much better <laughs> you know, to have somebody stand up and say, oh yeah, I know about that, or don't forget about. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's why Jerry's, Jerry's conversations work. Mm. Why Rex works, I think. Thanks. And it's the size of a conversation, which is five to seven people. Mm -hmm. well, anyway, thanks. this is this is this is. Uh, I see this. Oh, mm -hmm. 
so you have to evolve a practice of, yes. of analysis and and the best thing to do is be able to do it with a team doing this with a team that has to do something yeah make something happen so that they have a share shareable goal Hi. here's one of my friends now I honestly think I have just very briefly before I have to go anyway on the brain thing. If you think about it, I think the six minute idea is it's amusing, but unless you can work a way, work out a way of making of making the switching cost virtually zero, it's going to be a nightmare to administer. And I also my feeling is that given the vast scope and scale of everything you've put together, you should be trying, you should be pitching it as being a transformational high end type thing that people do this is something that you need this is something which can supercharge something that you want to do if it's yeah. a really serious proposition a really serious project and it will mean that you have got lots and lots of follow-up to do which of course we can help with uh, yes. for a suitable yes. fee exactly yes. for a certain yes <laughs> i was I, I can help you build that practice there you go <laughs> well stacy i was just putting in, in front of everyone uh uh, a, a brief description of Scott's reply with like, hey, it actually takes me five or six hours to process this if I'm going to take it seriously um, versus, hey, should I sell my time in six minute increments and just like take the bite size way down? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to experiment with both and then to turn the big one into a practice, yeah. uh, as you're saying right now, and then to figure out, is there a lightweight way to do context switching and to do like Bruce Lee being chased by ninjas? Um, on on the other small side, I don't know, but it's a, it's I, to me it's really intriguing because I I'm I'm pretty quick using it. The problem is that sometimes I don't understand what somebody's after for you know a half hour. Sometimes sometimes it's not the first thing they say that actually is what they meant to say. It's the fifth thing they say, and it isn't until you've thrashed around for a little bit that you discover oh 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 what you really like mean is this, and that doesn't happen in six minutes usually. No and. And, and getting into, I have uh, in my own own document, uh, practice documentation. I have a whole thing on getting in. Uh, how do getting you get in, in? Getting getting into a company, getting getting inside, or getting getting access to the kind of thing that you want to look at because you know that this guy's got, that's got a key. It has a, is a key to figuring out how this other problem that they have right. can be resolved. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and also I think you you know you need to remember house as well, right? Everybody lies. Patients always lie. Customers they do the same thing. They 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 will come to you. With, they will come to you telling you that they've got one particular problem, but the real problem, the real problem is something that you have to discover. Exactly. Right. And then they think that, and if you get it right, the annoying thing is they think they knew it already. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> It's like sure you did. <laughs> that's the that's the Zen life for you, right? Yes. Well, actually, the, the consulting sweet spot is when somebody comes up to you after a meeting and says, "I've been trying to tell them that for a decade, but because you, <laughs> but because you came in from the outside, they actually listened to you, and now we might actually get something done." That's like that's, right. that's sort of the opposite effect. But I like it. I kind of like it when that happens. Yeah, because cool. people don't listen. Once you're an employee, you, like really often, they don't listen to you. Yeah. Hmm. It's very strange. Having an external relationship and some at least mental independence really is a big deal. Hmm. Yes. Well, I was, yes, that's what, and then I went in to be inside one because I thought I could, I can't, I, I need to know how this works from the inside. <laughs> exactly. Which was anyway. All right. See you later, everyone. Thank you folks. Cheers guys. Nice you to really nice about to the see war you. for an hour a day, Bo. Okay. I'm prescribing that. All right. <laughs> All right. Ow. I'll just go read philosophy. That'll do it. Do it. There you oh. go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Which war? That's me, you, Susan. You mean the Peloponnesian War, right? <laughs> right. No. no, I'll just do Aristotle's metaphysics. Okay. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Good to see you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.